It's that marvelous time of the year, you know, almost better than Christmas when your birthday, it's midterm season. Nothing tops midterm season. You get that nice, stressful, like, oh my God, what am I going to fucking do? And then like, you hate life for a little while, but then when it's over, that stress goes mostly away and you get to just relax. And there's nothing like that relaxation after stress. So... Let's go through the midterm review. Uh, you will have, you can come in here as early as four next Tuesday. Uh, you have two hours, no matter when you come in. You have two hours. I Actually, I might extend it. Since I told you guys you can come in and have more time, I need to actually say so it has more time. Uh, and you can use your notes, stuff like that. Uh, it will show up after this. So on Tuesday, it'll be right after this. Okay. It'll say midterm test or midterm exam or some shit like that right here. Let's go through and do this test. So there's 28 questions on the review. I want to say there's 23 on the exam. I can look. I'll look before we're done. It's less. I thought there was going to be like 60. I'm so glad you said that. 60 would make it really hard to get that shit done. I could get it done probably in two hours, but I don't know that any of you would. And that's only because I use I teach this every day semester. I'm comfortable using stack crunch and shit like that. All right, so we've got a few questions on this review on qualitative versus quantitative. There won't be as many on the test, but there's a few here. Uh, determine whether this variable is qualitative or quantitative. Number of flights leaving an airport each year. Uh, so we could count them up. It's a number. So the answer is a number. Is that qualitative or quantitative? Yeah. What am I getting? I have a question. Um, is this review the same as like all the reviews? Each person, it'll do a fresh review for everyone. Similar questions, but not necessarily the same question. Okay. They have like a set of like 10 questions and they like randomize which one you get. But the topic for all of them is the same. This is going to be recorded, right? I'm recording it right now. Okay. Uh, I recommend doing the review a couple practice the test a couple times. If you have the time this weekend, do it a couple times. You'll see a couple variations of the questions. Uh, the more you have time to do it, the more runs you go through it, the easier, the faster you'll get, and the easier it'll be. Okay, so it's a number. So is that qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative. It's quantitative. It's quantitative because it's a numerical measure. That's D. Number of students at a university. Is that qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative. Quantitative. I can add them up, right? So you may have thought that one would be quantitative and one would be qualitative, but the computer just randomizes what it's going to give you. Okay, so here, interestingly enough, still number of students in class, but it says determine whether the quantitative variable is discrete or continuous. So discrete things we can count, continuous things we have to measure because they can be partial. We can't have a partial student. You can't be like a third of a student. That doesn't make any sense. Students are definitely countable, which makes them discrete. Try to go a little bit slower when I'm just saying shit orally. So for people that are speed riding over here, like Angel and Betta. Betta. Determine whether the quantitative variable is discrete or continuous, the volume of water in a swimming pool. 
that's something we could measure. You're just taking pictures of the answers, aren't you? That's something we could measure. Uh, since we can measure, we can't count it. Like, no one's counting the drops of water in a fucking pool. So this is continuous because it's not countable. It says, this one says, a new service conducted, a news service conducted a survey of 1,056 adults age 18 years or older in a certain country between August 31st and September 2nd of 2015. The respondents were asked of every tax dollar that goes to the federal government, how many cents of each dollar would you say are wasted? The four possible responses are that the federal government wastes less than 10 cents, between 11 cents and 25 cents, between 26 cents and 50 cents, or 51 cents or more. Like 51 cents or more is like saying they waste most of the money, over half. All right, so of the 1,056 individuals surveyed, 35% indicated that 51 cents or more is wasted. The news service reported that 35% of all adults in the country, 18 years or older, believe the federal government wastes at least 51 cents of each dollar spent with a margin of error of 6% and a 95% level of confidence. So they're not saying that the entire population is 35%, but it's within 6% of 35%. So we could subtract 6% off and it could be like as low as 29%. We could add 6% and it's as high as 41%. So they think it's between 29 and 41 and they're 95% confident of it. It might be 41.2, it might be just outside that range. But with the survey they took, it's unlikely. And you'll see how they came to that conclusion uh, when we go into confidence intervals and shit like that following the midterm. This is something you'll be able to figure out. So first thing they ask is, what is the research objective? To determine the number of adults in the country who believe the federal government wastes tax dollars? Well, they probably did, but that's not what they reported on. They reported on the percentage of people that indicated that 51 cents or more was wasted. So that's what we're looking for, what they reported on. They didn't use it to find the number of adults in the country. Uh, determining the percents of the adults in the country who believe the federal government weighs 51 cents or more. C is looking sounding pretty good. D says, determine the number of adults in the country paying their taxes. That didn't tell us who's paying their taxes. They didn't ask it. So it's got to be C. What is the population? The population is, they take the sample from the population. So you can look at the category what the sample is. It's adults, adults ages 18 years or older in a certain country. So that's the group, that's the population. So adults in the country age 18 years or older. What is the sample? The sample is the people that they actually surveyed. A survey of 1,056 adults. So it's the 1,056 adults in the country that were surveyed. All right, so descriptive stats are talking about what's going on with the sample. Inferential statistics is where they apply it to the overall population. So we're looking at what they're saying about the descriptive stats here. And it says 35% of our sample said 51 cents or more. That looks like B, but I'm gonna read the, the rest. C says 35% of all adults without any margin of error, C's out. A said there's a 95% chance surveying 1,056 individuals from the country rule. That's not what descriptive stats are. And the federal guy, they're just flat out saying wastes 51 cents or more of every dollar they receive. That's not it either. 
it's definitely talking about what the sample said. The sample said 35%. Why is it not highlighting? There we go. And it's only about the survey, not the entire population. So what are they inferring about the, the survey? They're taking that information and they're applying it to the overall population with this margin of error. So they're saying that between 29 and 41%, by subtracting and adding that margin of error, the six to the 35, that's the, the, the range they say it's in. That's what we're looking for. B says, I see the 29% to 41%. Let me read it real quick. The news service is 95% confident that the percentage of all adults in the country who believe the federal government weighs 51 cents or more is between 29 and 41. That, that is what's inferred. So that's the difference between descriptive stats and inferential stats. Descriptive stats, they're talking about the survey, which was part D. Part D, what are the descriptive stats? It talks about the survey, people surveyed. Inferential statistics is part E. They say, what can we take from the survey and apply it to the, how do we apply it to the overall population? Because we don't want to, you know, survey everyone in the population. And it's got to be the range. So it says, find the population mean or sample mean that is indicated. Some of these will say sample. Some of them say population. You have to pay attention because the number is going to be the same, but the symbol changes. A, mu here, mu is for populations, and X bar is for samples. And they're telling me samples, so I know I'm going to be using B right now. So... I could do this by hand, but since they're going to let me use StatCrunch, I'm going to use StatCrunch. We can go to Stats, Calculators, or not, sorry, Stats, Summary Stats, Columns. We did this in Chapter 3 a bunch. We tell it what column we want to do. We tell it we want the mean. And it gave me 11. So you have stat crunch do the work, stats, summary, stats, columns. You've done this before a few times in chapter three. Yeah. Uh, so if it says, if I'm to say uh, population, uh, find the population, mean, would you uh, uh, get the- It'd be the same steps, but I would put it in A. Oh, okay. So you would have to use the other test. No, there's only one mean listed. The standard deviation is the one that changes. Good question, though. You can look for another mean, but you're going to find one. All right. For a large sporting bar, or sorry, large sporting event, the broadcaster sold 52 ad slots for a total revenue of $133 million. What was the mean price per ad slot? I'm going to use, ah, oh shit, didn't let me do Excel. Only stat crunch. All right, so when we're doing mean, let me write down what we got here. So it says I've got 52 ad slots and total revenue was $133 million. They want the mean price per ad slot. That's what it says, price per ad slot. Whenever you see something like A per B, that means A over B. 
So this one right here says price per ad slot. I'm putting the total money we made over the ad slots, 52 ad slots. They actually tell you the order to do it in. If you pay attention. And it says one decimal place. So let's see what I get. Somewhere on this screen, I can put it and you'll be able to read it. There it is. Nope, can't read it there. You read it over there? 2.5576. We're going to one decimal place. So we got to round up. And it's in millions, so we don't need to actually type out the millions. We're gonna do just use what I had right there. You don't want to say two million six hundred thousand. You want to write two point six. Compute the range and sample standard deviation. All right. This is in stats and summary stats. And columns. It did say samples, so we're going to use this standard deviation. If it says population standard deviation, you got to come down here and use the unadjusted one. Uh, and they want, oh, they did not want mean, they wanted a range in standard deviation. Look at these tricky bastards. The range in standard deviation. Way to read the fucking question, Dave. Just got all antsy. They normally look, ask mean and standard deviation. They said range. It says it right there. I got all crazy. So this one to one decimal place is going to be 504.1. And I had 1180 for the other one. I'm just highlighting and doing control C to copy and control V to paste. If you use a Mac, uh, fucking, I don't know, the Apple key, the command key, what is it? The command, it's called the command key. I don't use Mac. I am an avid anti Mac person. Fuck that Apple logo. Fuck looking for everything. I can't, I can't handle it. I need my start menu. Things go in a start menu. I don't need the entire bottom bar cluttered with shit. This is fucking confusing. All right. Scores of an IQ test have a bell-shaped distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 17. I'm going to write this shit down. I'm going to draw by hand, and then I'll show you a quicker way to get the shape or the shapes you're looking for. So this is the IQ test. I know you can't see what I'm writing. Ah, fuck it. I'll show you what I'm writing. IQ test mean is 100. Standard deviation is 17. And all of these are percentages. So what is the percentage? A is between 49 and 151. B is 
less than 83 or greater than 117. And C is greater than 134. All right, so what you need to remember for your stuff, it says use the empirical rule. If it says use the empirical rule, you need that fucking graph with all the columns and the percentages broken down. Mu goes in the middle and we go out three deviations to the right. Only three. Don't go crazy and do four. You do four, you're a psycho. Or a follower of the Latter-day Saints. One of the two. Before I put the values underneath, I'm going to just make a note of what's in each region. The percentages. So the middle two are 34% in each zone. The next one out is 13.5 each direction. Then 2.35 and finally 0 0.15. Those are the four numbers you need to remember for this. There's only four numbers to remember. 34%, 13.5%, 2.35%, 0 0.15%. And they radiate outwards from the center. All right, let's go putting values on here. The mean goes in the middle and we add 17 each step we go to the right. We subtract 17 each step, I go to the left. I guess some other handy things to remember here, uh, plus or minus one deviation is 68%. Plus or minus two is 95%. Plus or minus three is 99.7 for the empirical rule. So problem A was 49 to 151. A is here to here. That is plus or minus three deviations. So it's going to be 99.7%. B. B says less than 83. So B is this region right here, or greater than 117, which is this region right here. So there's a couple ways you can go about doing it. You can add up one region and then add up the other. They're the same on both sides, it's symmetrical. Uh, so you could just double, add up one side and double it. The other option you have is it doesn't include the middle region. So I could do 100% minus the two 34% equals 32%. If I add up each of those, 0 0.15, 2.35, 13.5, you're going to get 16. There's 16 on the left, 16 on the right. 16 plus 16 is 32. Finally, CE is just greater than 234 or 134. 
Let's see. That's 2.35 plus 0 0.15. That's 2.5%. So those are the three answers I'm entering. All right, so let's go put this in stack. Does anyone need that out longer? So I had 99.7, I had 32, and I had 2.5. Before I go to the next problem, I want to show you a way that will help you, could help you, if you don't fuck it up. So we have, we know it follows a, a bell-shaped distribution, which is a normal distribution. So I can put this information into the normal calculator. And I can tell it a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 17. And if I click compute, it gives me the 68, 95, 99.7. I can quickly see the numbers that go on the bottom row. Not only that, I can put these in to see what the shading is. So between 49 and 151, it's telling me it's, it's plus or minus all three. Don't use this. Don't use that because that's the, the normal calculator. The empirical rule has everything like rounded to a very specific value. So if you use this to do the table faster, you just have to remember, you still need to apply these percentages. The only reason for doing that graph is to like make it the, make this picture faster, okay? The accompanying data represents the miles per gallon of a random sample of cars with three cylinders, a uh, three cylinder engine, 1.0 liter engine. Compute the Z score obtained for the 32.5. So I'm just gonna write down the things it asked me. Z score for 32.5. B is find the quartiles. C is compute and interpret IQR. And D is lower upper fences. And an outlier. Now, the z-score, we had a formula for it. I'll write it down in a second. It was the x minus mu divided by sigma. We need the mean and the standard deviation. But they didn't give that here. They just gave a table of data. So I got to use the table of data and find the mean and standard deviation, which is not too bad. We'll just do stats, summary stats, and columns. I'm going to tell it mean and standard deviation. It also said it wanted the quartiles. So I'm going to pick those real quick. I'm going to get all the data at once. 
The quartiles are min, Q1, median, Q3, and max. And it also wanted the IQR. So we can get a lot of the information we need from StatCrunch. I don't know how many decimal places they want and how many decimal places they want. Let's find out. Two decimal places. I'll write down more than two on my table real quick. So I'm writing down the mean is 38.94. One six six seven standard deviation is three point five zero one zero four five four min Q one median Q three and max. So this is what I'm writing down. You might as well see it as I'm writing it down because you're not, it's probably easier to read from my handwriting. Thirty two point five. Q1 was 36.9, median is 38.6, Q3 was 41, the max was 48.9, and IQR was 4.1. So these are the results I got from StatCrunch. And now I'll give you a second to write them down and then we're gonna use them. Okay, so z-score is x minus mu over sigma. In this case, 32.5 minus 38.9416 over 3.5013. Five zero one zero four. I only needed to two decimal places, so that if I do more than two decimal places, then round, I should be in good shape. So I did the top first, then I hit enter, and then I did divide by the 3.50. And I'm getting Z equals negative 1.98 to two decimal places. So that'll be my part A, that's an eight. That looks a little bit more like an eight. There we go. That's a little bit easier to read. The quartiles, they didn't actually, I know from doing this earlier today, these are the three they want. They ask for Q1, Q2, Q3. Median is Q2. IQR is computed right here. StatCrunch did it. But IQR is Q3 minus Q1 
It represents the inner 50%. And finally, we need to calculate the lower and upper fences. The lower fence is Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR. Upper fence is Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. And I think they told me not to round on those. So I'm not gonna round this at all. I'm gonna do 1.5 times IQR real quick. IQR is the 4.1. And let's see what I get. Six point one five. So this is my 1.5 times IQR. I'm gonna use that over here on the fences. So lower fence is Q1, which is 36.9 minus that value. And I'm getting 30.75. The upper fence is Q3, which is 41, plus that value is 47.15. So that's what I need to enter for the lower and upper fences. They ask about outliers. Outliers are anything outside this range. which you can look at the table and find, or if you wanna be lazy, you can just do graph and box plot. And if it's got an outlier, there will be a dot and you put your cursor over the dot. That's what I'm gonna do, cause I'm a lazy fucker. All right. Is anyone still? Oh, I see some people still writing. So patience, David. People look done. Let's go do it. All right, so, oh shit, I closed it. I'm gonna have to add that back up in a second. So compute the Z-score. Let me open it right now. And I'll come back to that in a second, okay. Compute the Z-score. The Z-score is negative 1.9. God damn it, I shrank that for a reason. And the data value is positive 1.98 standard deviations below the mean. So this should be positive unless stack or the unless they fucked it up. The wording on this indicates a distance. And distance is positive. So if it's negative, this is still going to be positive. If this is positive, they're both positive and they're the same number. Determine the quartiles, we had these. 
Q1 was 36.9, Q2 was 38.6, and Q3 was 41. So the inner quartile range we've had it, or it's 4.1, and it's the inner 50%. So that's what we're looking for. The inner quartile range, it is the range of the middle 50%. I want that one. And it was 4.1. I calculated the lower fence as 30.75. And I calculated the upper fence as 47.15. And asked if there's any outliers. I got to go look. Now I can look. There's nothing below 30.75. These are in order. There's actually a number above. 47.15, it's this 48.9. Or you can do graph box plot. And you can see the outlier here. You just put your cursor over it and it tells you it's 48.9. So there's a couple ways to grab that piece of information. But the outlier is 48.9. All right, so they ask us the first thing is, what is the shape of this distribution? Anyone know? Uh, it's skewed right, right? The right side's a lot longer, bigger than the left side. So this is gonna be skewed right. And this is the five number summary. Okay, so the five number summary, the left point here is the first number. So this is above the zero. So my first number is a zero. Motherfucker. Where the box starts is Q1. That looks like it's above two. The middle line is the median, which looks like it's at four. The right side of the box is Q3, and that is two less than eight. Two less than eight, or two less than 10. I mean, two less than 10 is eight. And it looks like the biggest number is just one below 20. One below 20 is 19. Not too bad, right? You guys ready for more? Need longer, Angel? No, You'll be there right now. I have no idea what you're doing. All right. It's okay. Don't worry. We're all wall. Just wait on you. It's all good. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to write down what it says on the paper. We're starting to get into the probability section. So for me, question number 12 says P of E equals 0 0.4. P of F equals 0 0.35. And it says find P of E and F if... P of E or F equals 0 Okay, so we had the formula. The general addition rule was P of E or F equals P of E 
plus P of F minus P of E and F. So we're gonna take advantage of that. We have some values for those. P of E or F is listed as 0 0.70. P of E is 0 0.4. P of F is 0 0.35. And I don't know what this last one is. I'm just gonna say minus P so I don't have to write it down a bunch. All right, so if I add these up, the two on the right equals 0 0.75. Oh, that should be 0 0.70 on the left. 0 0.75 plus 0 0.75 plus 0.75. So if I subtract this over, I get negative 0 0.05 equals negative P. So since they're both negative, then the P has to match the 0 0.05. And that's P of E and F. That's what I'm looking for here. I'm going to put that in and see what the next question is. Next question is more probability. It's a golf ball question. It says there is five black, nine red, Re brown. And it says find the probability of black or red. We actually have the equation for four up here. So putting that in, it's probability of black plus probability of red minus probability of black and red. So to continue, I need to know how many total balls there are. Uh, nine plus three is 12, plus five is 17. There's 17 balls. So the probability of black is five over 17. Probability of red is nine over 17. And the probability of both is zero. Can't be black and red simultaneously. They're solid colored balls. So this is, we add the top parts, 14 over 17. And they want that as a decimal to three decimal places. To three decimal places, I've got 0 All right, number 14 is a deck of cards question. Uh, it says we're only picking one card. So A is the probability 
of a heart or a spade. Part B is the probability of a heart, a spade, or a diamond. And C is the probability of a four or a diamond. So we're gonna do the same thing we did up here. We're adding together the probabilities and if there's any overlap, we subtract it. There is no overlap between hearts or spades though. There are 13 hearts out of 52 cards. And there are 13 spades out of 52 cards. That is together is 26 over 52. This one's actually really easy, it's 0 0.5. This one, there's 13 out of 52 for each of them. So this gives us 39 over 52, which is 0 0.75. And then this last one, probability of four or a diamond. I wish they didn't use a four because there are four fours and it looks like I'm using that number. It just happens to be there's four fours, there's 13 diamonds, and there is one that is both. So we got to subtract the four of diamonds. This ends up being 16 over 52. And to three decimal places, this is 0 0.308. This middle region is the slowest, the probabilities. Near the end, everything's on stack crunch and it goes super fucking fast. Is ready for more? A couple of people are still right. Slow your shit down, Jones. Number 15. Number 15 says probability of flipping nine heads in a row.
So this is like the first one being ahead and second being ahead and third being ahead and dot, 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 all the way up to the ninth being ahead. Each one of these is one half. And the and is a multiplication. So I have nine of them. It's one half to the ninth power. If I do 0. 0.5 to the ninth power, I get 0. 0.00195. Three one two five, and they want five decimal places. The five decimal places zero point zero zero one nine five, and then it says, "What if you did this ten thousand times?" The expected result, when you have a probability and you have a total number of trials, you just multiply them here. 10,000 times 0 0.00195. Looks like it's gonna be 19.5, but I'm gonna multiply by 10,000 just to make sure I'm not being crazy. 19.53125 uh, is what my calculator says. And like you're counting there, like how many can you expect? You're not going to expect 19.5. So they, they want you to round to the nearest whole number. The nearest whole number would be 20. So we could expect 20. All right, next question. So they have two cards are chosen randomly from a deck. So A is what is the probability that the first card is a queen? And second card is a queen. In fact, they both say this. A and B say this. Same thing. First equals queen and second equals queen. The difference is on A, sampling is done without replacement. So you don't put the card back in the deck. This one is with replacement. So for A, the first card being a queen, there are four card, four queens out of 52 cards. And for the second one being a queen, there's only three queens left and there's only 51 cards left. So I have 12 over, what is 52 times 51? Over 2,652. This is 0, 0.00, 
how many do they want three decimal places? So I would round to three decimal places. I get zero zero five. On B, I put them back in the deck. So I draw a queen out. There's four out of 50 true. I draw another queen out, but I put the first queen back in. So there's still four queens in the deck. There's still 52 cards in the deck. So one divided by 13, and then I square it. 0 0.00591, and again, three decimal places, 0 0.006. Seventeen. When I did seventeen earlier, it had a fucking glitch in it. We'll see if it does today. It made it look like I didn't know what I was talking about. Rude sons of bitches. Is ready for more? Anyone need it up longer? If you do, say something because it's going away. All right. This is problem number 17. This is the soda problem for me. It's a soda problem earlier, so I suspect it's going to be a soda problem for you. For me, it says there's three cans of regular. In a diet 12 pack. So there was an accident in production. If there's three of them are regular, that means only nine of them were diet. So we have three regular and nine diet. Then they ask the probability that both are diet. Pick two cans. Sorry, I missed that part. Then they want the probability both are regular. And then probability one of each. All right, so both being diet, the first one is a diet. There's nine diets out of 12. The second one being diet, there's only eight diets left, and there's only 11 cans left. This is 72 out of 132. 12 times 11, I think, is 132. Yep. So 17 divided by 132 is... And they want four decimal places here. I'm getting 0 0.128. And it goes 878787. Rounding is going to give me 88. Then probability both are regular. Well, the first one, there's only three regulars out of 12, and then there's only two regulars out of 11. 
So this is six over 132. And again, four decimal places, zero, four, five, four, five, four, five, rounded to four is four, five, five. And finally, one of each can be done two ways. First equals diet, second equals regular, or first equals regular, second equals diet. So we're doing this both ways. Uh, first being diet would be nine cans out of 12. The second being regular is three cans out of 11. Or turned into a plus. Then red first, there was three red, not red, regular, three regulars out of 12. And then on the second can, there was only 11 cans left. And nine of them were diet. This is gonna be 27 plus 27 over 132. 54 over 132. Let's see what that is. Zero point four zero nine zero nine zero to four decimal places is that. So those are my three answers to this problem. Yeah. Because I'm being a scrub. I added them and I should have multiplied them. That is the wrong fucking answer. You just saved me from having a fucking flawed answer. I appreciate that. Even the best, I'd like to think I'm one of the best, make mistakes. So my pro tip when you're taking the test, write this shit all down while you're doing it. And then if you've got time at the end of the test, don't click submit. Go back to problem one and make sure you entered everything the way you thought you entered it. Okay? If you've got time, redo the calculator work. It doesn't take that long, and you're better off. You want to be right rather than wrong, right? All right. Good looking out. Point. They ask if it's unusual. If it's below 0 0.05, it is unusual. They'll ask you that on this. All right, number 18. They give me a probability table. It's zero, one, two, three, four, and it's zero point one five, zero point one nine, zero point two five, zero point two eight, and zero point one three. And they ask, is this a discrete probability distribution?
second to write that down. So for it to be a probability distribution, each, each has to be between zero and one. Each P of X, I should say. And in this case, they are. And second, they have to add to one. So let's see what this adds up to. 0 0.15 plus 0 0.19 plus 0 0.25 plus 0 0.28 plus 0 0.13. I'm getting 1.00. So it meets both criteria. So you're going to want to answer the one that says yes and list both. There's like a good does yes a couple of ways. Yes is the both one. The sum of the probabilities is equal to one. And each probability is between zero and one. All right, you guys ready for the next question? I need more paper. I got no, I, no, I got some right here. I just meant I needed some right here. I appreciate that though. I'll always like it when someone lets me be a lazy fuck. All right, this one is on investments. I'm going to show it to you. Actually, don't need paper for this. This is going to be a stat crunch thing. So it says the an investment counselor has got a hot stock tip. He says if the economy remains strong, the investment will result in a profit of fifty thousand. If the economy grows at a moderate pace, it'll result in a profit of ten thousand. But if it goes into a recession, there's a loss of fifty thousand. They give us percentages of 20% for strong, 60% for moderate, and 20% for a recession. What is the expected profit? We can use stack crunch on this. This is our cut. Oh. Rude, it fucking logged me out. All right, come back over here and. Like I'm still taking the test. Why am I fucking logged out? Now it's all big. Okay, so we did this with stats calculators custom. What you need is you need a value for your a column for your values a column for your weights, which is your P of X. So I have 50,000 profit at 0.20%, not percent, 0 0.20, which represents 20%. I have a $10,000 profit at 60% probability. And I have a negative, a loss, negative 50,000 at 20%, which is 0 0.20. So if you throw this into the table, make the table for it, and you do stats, calculators, custom, we're going to tell it the values. I actually label them. So values are in values. Weights are in weights. Just click compute and the expected profit is the mean. 
So my expected profit is $6,000, which I got from the mean right here. That's all there is on that one. Next one's even easier. It says this is a binomial distribution or probability experiment. And it gives us N, P, and X. So if we have N, P, and X, we can do the binomial calculator. We can do stats, calculators, binomial. I need to set my values to what they have, 13.3, and X is less than four. And it says round to four decimal places. I will copy the four decimal places. And I'll look at the one on the right. It's a one, so I don't need to round up. I can just copy and paste. I wonder if I can make this a little bit smaller. So I copied and pasted and I didn't need to round. Next question. According to an airline flight, or I'm sorry, according to an airline, Lights on a certain route are on time 75% of the time. Suppose 10 flights are randomly selected and the number of on-time flights is recorded. Explain why this is a binomial experiment. It's a binomial, there's four reasons. I can go larger so we can see it. The trials have to be independent. There are two mutually exclusive outcomes. The experiment is performed a fixed number of times. And the probability of success is the same for each trial. There you go, now you can see them all. All right, then it says find N and P. N is the number of flights that we're checking, 10. P is the probability that they're on time, 0. 0.75. Oh shit, there's a lot here. There's a C, D, E, and F. So I want the probability that exactly six are on time. I can go through and edit this over here and check it. I want to say X equals six. And I'm getting to four decimal places, 0 0.1459. The next number is a nine, so I got to round up. Rounding up means going to 60 at the end. 
And then it wants us to interpret the pr probability. In 100 trials, how many can we expect? What you want to do for 100 trials, you multiply it by 100. It's the same thing as moving the decimal point to the right twice. Now, this is what we would expect, but you, we can't have 0.59 of a flight. So we got a round to the nearest whole number. The nearest whole number is 15. The probability that fewer than six flights are on time, we want less than, and to four decimal places, I have this value. I do not need to round up. It does the 100 trials again here, so I'll do the same thing. I'll move the decimal over twice, and I'll look at it, and I'll round that to the nearest whole number. That will round up to an eight. At least six is more than and including two, greater than or equal to. I've got 0 0.9218. If I round up, I should round up to one nine. If I do that as a decimal or move the decimal right twice, I get 92.19. In this case, I'm rounding down. I have to round up or down? I rounded up last time. Okay. And finally, between four and six, inclusive, I can do the between calculator. And I'm getting 0 0.2206. What? 0 0.2. 2206. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. My bad. And if I move the decimal point twice and round it, I'm going to get 22. That's it on that one. You guys ready for another? Suppose that a recent poll found that 62% of adults believe that the overall state of moral values is poor. For 200 randomly selected adults, compute the mean and standard deviation of the random variable X, which is the number of adults who believe that the overall state is poor. All right, so now I need the camera. So this is the moral values one. They gave me P equals 62% or 0 0.062. And A says for 200 people, find the mean and standard deviation. This is a binomial distribution. Either, you either think they have poor moral values or you don't. So for a binomial distribution, the mean is n times p. The standard deviation is n times p times 1 minus p. So here I've got 200 times 0.62. is 124. That's my mu. My sigma is, I already got NP. I'm just going to put it in right there. That's NP. And then doing 1 minus P. And then I'm going to take the square root. And I'm getting the square root is 6.864400. I don't know how many decimal places they wanted.
Oh, they want the nearest tenth. <laughs> So 6.9. Okay, you guys ready for the screen? All right. Turbert the mean. For every 200 adults, the mean is the range that would be expected. No, the mean isn't a range of numbers. The mean is just one number. So it's not A. For every 200 adults, the mean is the number of them that would be expected to believe that, that the overall state of moral values is poor. That sounds right. The mean is expected to be, but I'm gonna check C and D real quick. C says for every 200, the mean is the minimum number. That's not true. And D, for every 124 adults, 120, the population of the sample size was 200. And it says maximum. So there's a couple things wrong with D. So I'm going to leave it as B, the, the expected one. And then it says, would it be unusual if 112 of them think it's poor. I'm going to use this binomial calculator. And even though they say just 112, they mean 112 or less. Okay. They mean less than 112 here. They didn't, this is not a very well worded question. Less than 112, would it be unusual? My probability is below 5%. It's 0 0.047, which is less than 0 0.05. So yes, this would be unusual. All right, next problem. Yeah, wait, nope, I'm still writing. Slow your shit, Jones. Are you making notes or do you need the screen angel? It says the hits to a website occur at the rate of 10 per minute between 7 and 12 p.m. The random variable X is the number of hits to the website. State the values of lambda and T. Lambda is the rate. It's 10 per minute. That's my lambda, 10. Now, whatever lambda tells you, like the per part, it's per minute. So T is going to be in minutes. And so they're just asking between 11.48 and 11.54. Between that time, six minutes happened between 11.48 and 11.54. That's it on that one. That's literally, that's a, that's a freebie damn near. 
The fucking numbers are given to you. All you got to be able to do is subtract time. All right, Poisson process. This is just like the question you were asking me earlier. So it says P6. First off, we need the Poisson calculator. So I need to get a calculator that's Poisson. The mean is what goes here, and it says it's three. When it says P parenthesis six, that means parenthesis X equals six. So if they don't give you a symbol, they're saying equals. And it says, do not, the do not round until the final answer. That's like if you're doing it by hand. Don't do this by hand. Use stack crunch. So round to four decimal places, 0 0.0504. I don't need to round up, so I'll just paste it. And then it's got probably the X is less than six. They actually give me the symbols on everything but the top one. This is also four decimal places. It looks like I need to round up. Probability that X is greater than or equal to six. Here, I don't need to round. Well, not round up, I mean. And what's the final one? Between four and seven. Looks like I need to round up on this one too. So zero eight goes to zero nine. And that's it on that one. Ready? Okay, the hurricane one. Uh, we did this in lecture. So it says it follows a Poisson distribution. We need to find the rate. The rate is 30, the number of hits divided by the number of years. They actually tell you how to do it. It says, assume that this is typical and the number of hits per year. Hits per year tells me to do hits, 35, per 115 years. So I have 35 divided by the 115. And if I do that in a calculator, point three zero four three four seven eight two six. I'm going to copy that. Actually, yeah, I'm going to copy it. So we need to do the probability here that it will not be hit by any major hurricane. That is zero hurricane. Where's my Poisson calculator? There, we, I got to go to calculator. Calculator, Poisson. We just calculated the mean. I'm going to use the whole thing from the calculator. Let the computer do all the rounding. I want the probability that X equals zero.
Zero hits to four decimal places. Seven, three, seven, six. Then it says the state will be hit by at least one. At least one is greater than or equal to one. And if I do four decimal places here, I get 2623, but I got to round up. So I'll place the three with a four. Is this unusual? It is above 0 0.05, so it is not unusual. What is the probability this state will be hit by at least three? Well, that just changes this to three. And it's minuscule. Look at how small that is. Wait, I only need four decimal places. Looks like I don't need to round here either. That is going to be unusual, though, because it's less than 0 0.05. And finally, at least two. At least two, point zero three seven nine, and I don't need to round up. This is also unusual because it's below point zero five. That's it for that one. All right, chocolate chips. The number of chocolate chips in an 18-ounce bag of chocolate chip cookies is approximately normally distributed with a mean of 1252 and a standard deviation of 129. I need to use my normal calculator. It says normally distributed. So I've got a mean of 1252 and a standard deviation of 129. It says, what is the probability that a randomly selected bag contains between 1,000 and 1,400? I got to go to between and enter those values. And it gives it to me, and they want four decimal places. They're being kind of consistent right now. I don't trust that. They like to change shit up. Still four decimal places. Looks like I got a round up. And rounding up changes the 89 to a 90. Then part B says fewer than 1,050. Fewer is less than. And four decimal places is 0 0.0586. Again, I got to round up. And then it says the proportion of the bag that contains more than 1,175, more than is the greater than. I change this to 1,175. I click compute. And to four decimal places, 7247. And finally, it wants percentile, 1,000 chips. So I'm going to do less than. And this gives me the percentile. So, but I need to write it as a percent. 
So that's what it gave me to write it as a percent. I got to move the decimal point right twice, which puts it there. And then it says round to the nearest integer. The nearest integer would be three. Which seems like it was going to be a three because they had an RV there for third. And it's the only number that has an RV. So it looks like, like fucking the setup. Like, all right, then we go next one. We're almost there. We've almost done it, folks. All right, we've got a new, it's another bag of chocolate chip cookies with a new mean and a new standard deviation. The mean is higher with less deviation. That's interesting. It says determine the 26th percentile. Here to do that, we just set this equal to the percentile we're looking for. And it tells us to round to the nearest whole number. That's my thing. My nearest whole number is 1188. The number of chocolate chips that make up the middle 96%. I'll come over here and I'll set this to 0.96. And they want us to round. This time, I know for certain that they want us to round regularly. So this goes to, oh, I'm pretty sure that that's what happened this morning. This goes to 1023. And that goes to 1503. And this is the interquartile range. Is that all there is, the interquartile, okay. So 0. 0.50. So, the larger number is 1341.91. The smaller number is 1184. Oops, I got too many there. 0 0.08. All right, so I'm going to round them and I get 1342 and 1184. And now interquartile range is subtract. It's Q3 minus Q1. It's the middle 50%. We talked about that earlier with the interquartile range. So subtract these, 1342 minus, why is that not doing that? And that doesn't work like Excel, so you kind of got to like do it in a calculator. I'm getting 158. Next, one more question. Everyone ready? The time required for an automotive center to complete an oil change service on an automobile approximately follows a normal distribution with a mean of 19 minutes and a standard deviation of 2.5. It says the automotive center guarantees customers that the service will take no longer than 20 minutes. If it does take longer, they receive it at half price. What percentage of customers receive the service for half price? They receive it for half price if it takes longer than 20 minutes. So we need to do X is greater than 20 minutes. That's a lot of fucking people. So it says 
it's got the percent sign there. So it wants it as a percent. So I'm going to put the, move the decimal right twice. And this is round to two decimal places means round off that part. The first number is a seven, which means I got to raise that five to a six. If the automotive center does not want to give the discount to more than 2% of its customers, it wants to make this 2% over here. So I'm getting this number. You should check both, round down and round up. We need the number on the right to be less than, that should be 0.02. There we go. Let's change that. We need the number when I try, I'm going to try 24 and 25. 24 is the correct way to round. But if I do, I have higher than 2%. I have 2.27 and they didn't want anything more than two. So 24 minutes is not going to work. 25 has got to be the way. So even though it's the not the correct way to round, 25 will answer this question, question correctly. So that's the one that we got to pay attention to. If I had was doing this myself, I'd go back through and look and make sure all my answers. Uh, but we got like two minutes left in class. So I'm just going to click submit quiz. MFR. What did I miss? Fuck you. I did that in the stack crunch. No, I didn't. I did it by hand. I did that shit by hand. So there's a good chance I fucked up the by hand thing. All right. So then I'm going to check my other one, see what's wrong. Oh, I fucking miskeyed. I had 0.5, I think. This was number 17. Let me look. Yeah. No, they're fucking wrong. Both are regular. They're saying both is regular is over fucking 50% when there's only three cans out of 12. That's a wrong answer. So just so you know, when you submit it, it should tell you your score, but that's not your score. Pepe comes through and looks at each person's test, looks at like what was done wrong, and like sees if there was like if it was a mistake on the calculator, the computer's part. Like, would I get the correct answer if I did it myself? And then if I see you did a rounding error, like if you rounded wrong, if you said 0.08 and it was supposed to be 0.09, I'm only docking you, I'll give you most of the credit on the problem. Because all you did was round wrong. You did everything else right. So I do a lot of correcting with stuff as well, but there are errors. So don't like whatever you get on the test, don't just assume that's it. I will email everyone when I'm done and let you know uh, what it was. This was the moral values one. What did I miss here? Remember you can come here at four. No way, I checked that thing and I did it in the fucking stack crunch. That's fucking wrong. So that would have been another one I'd have to look at and fucking verify. All right, that's it folks. Get the fuck out. I'll get this posted tonight. I recommend doing that review, practice review a few times.